Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the virtual open house. What? My name is Ashlyn and I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm super thrilled to be here today with all of you. And I'm super pleased to be today's host for this geographic analysis session as a part of Ryerson's virtual open house, which is taking place all of this week from um, last week all the way to this Friday. And there are many sessions taking place throughout the virtual open house that we encourage you to check out. And you can look those up by visiting us on our website and register to any and all um, sessions that are of interest to you. To start, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land. Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. Ryerson has shifted to an essential services model to help prevent the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have put together a series of virtual sessions in order to share information and connect with you. Ryerson is working diligently to provide students with a fulsome experience while maintaining the health and safety of our community. Before we get started, I just did want to share some housekeeping Zoom tips with you. First, we encourage you to ask questions. To do so, simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. When you do that, another window will appear for you to be able to ask a question. Simply type out your question there and submit it to us. We have many staff members and students on the back end to be able to help you with that question. If you are having any audio or video issues, please flag it to us through that Q&A pod. A member of our staff will be there to assist you. Also, you can arrange your screen any which way you'd like. It's not gonna affect how other users see their Zoom window or how we see it on our end. So please make yourself as comfortable as possible. You can move things around to make it the best experience for you viewing it um, from wherever you are. This presentation will be closed captioned to ensure accessibility. So if you require closed captioning, please select that option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also note that this session is being recorded and will be available on our website on a later date. To start us off, I'd like to know who's joining us. So I'm gonna launch a poll. Bear with me for a second, there we go. It should, it should appear right on your screen. Perhaps you're a prospective student looking to join us next fall, or maybe you're a prospective student looking to join us a little bit further into the future. Maybe you're a university or college student looking to transfer to Ryerson, or perhaps you're a parent or guardian or even a teacher or counselor. Please fill out that poll right now. It should be popping up on your screen. And if you don't see it, don't worry. You can let us know through the Q&A pod as well. Give it another couple of seconds as I see only 33% of us have answered it. Awesome, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll there. So it looks like it's a 50-50 split for now uh, between university um, and college transfer student and some parents as well, but not everyone participated in the poll. So I'm sure that we also have some prospective students for next year as well um, in the room. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sarah and, and Tutama as a part of our geographic analysis program to start us off with this presentation. Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Sutama Ghosh and I will uh, present to you a little bit about sort of the BA honors in geographic analysis. I'm going to talk to you about the program and, the, and give you an overview of the program. So uh, my name is, as I said, Sutama Ghosh. I'm now the undergraduate program director of this program. And I come to you uh, carrying a message from uh, Dr. David Atkinson, who's the department chair. Uh, we all uh, you know, hope that you will join us in September. And I'm also joined by Sarah Carmichael, she's the undergraduate program director, and she provides academic advice and guidance to students throughout their degree. In this presentation, she will join us, as will some of our students. 
So I'll start with uh, what geography is all about. Recently, you have uh, you know all witnessed the American elections, and in that American election, you must have seen tons of maps that look uh, red and blue, and they keep changing. So all those things are done by geographers who use real-time, real-world data and map them. So geography is all the rage. It is soaring in popularity. Geography is a subject of our times. It is inherently interdisciplinary and geographers are eminently employable. Some of these points I will touch during our presentation. So why should you learn geography? You should learn geography because not geography is not what you learn uh, in, in high schools per se. Uh, it's not just about capitals and rivers and uh, cities. It is more than that. Geography actually bridges the social sciences. It brings the parts of human geography together with natural sciences such as physical geography. So you learn how people live within various physical as well as social environments. So geography draws a lot from other disciplines such as political science, economics, and sociology in the arts side, but also from biology, from hydrology, from chemistry, etc., from the science side. Geography can be learned formally in the classroom, but also experientially through travel, field work, and expeditions. This is what we do in our department. What we offer is career-oriented degree. We have an award-winning faculty. We have state-of-the-art laboratory facilities, smaller class sizes. We offer internship, alumni and industry connections, entrance scholarships, career-relevant education, as well as student organizations. Ours is a career-oriented degree. Started in 1970, it is one of the oldest departments in Ryerson. What we teach is applied geography, where we balance geographic theory with spatial applications. In other words, what you're learning in class, we show it, show it to you in the ground. So it is a very much a grounded learning. We have expert faculty members in our department who come from a variety of um, topics, who come with diff different research ideas in retail, marketing, economic geography, economic immigration and settlement studies, urban studies, public health, health geography, environmental science, as well as spatial analysis. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about geographical information system. So our department is known for its geographical information system and the education it imparts. And geographical information system, as many of you know, is actually a, an integration of hardware and software and data that is captured, managed, analyzed, and displayed using various forms of uh, mapping techniques. So with that, uh, you know, the training in GIS, people can concentrate in four areas of concentration. Urban studies, which is about city building and how people live in cities. Location analysis, which deals with businesses and where they should be located or not located, or resources uh, that need to be given to an area that is devastated by flood or earthquake. Then we have demography, which is about population as well as environment. So, you know, you could actually specialize in any one of these four areas of concentration. Over to Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, as already mentioned, my name is Sarah Carmichael. Um, I'm the undergraduate program administrator, and I'll be your first point of contact any questions or concerns you have while you're in the program. Um, I'm going to briefly outline now what your first year will look like in terms of your courses. Um, so our incoming first year students join something called the Common Platform, along with all other students in the Faculty of Arts. So all students in the faculty take the same two required courses in first year, critical thinking and academic writing and research. 
plus elective courses in humanities and social sciences. So our, uh, geographical um, our GA students take only three required courses in first year out of 10. So energy, earth and ecosystems, location, 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 and geography and GIS. So as well as getting a flavor of geography, geography through the required courses, students have an opportunity to try lots of different courses in first year. So there's lots of flexibility to try new things. Um, so I also wanted to note that it's possible for our students to take a minor in a different subject area as part of their degree. So a minor is six courses out of the courses that make up our degree. So you don't need to declare a minor at the start of your programme. So it could be that you enjoy a particular elective subject and want to build on it to make a minor as you go. Um, so you declare your minor at the end of your degree. So there's lots and lots of flexibility around this. Um, and you can take a minor in most disciplines at Ryerson. And here's a selection um, that, of minors that are quite popular with our students. So environment and urban sustainability in particular. But our students also take business minors, politics, law, criminology. So now I'm going to talk to you uh, about field trips. I don't know whether you can see me. Um, so I'm back. Uh, my name is Sutama Ghosh again. So we are going to talk about field trips. So our department really prides on experiential learning and we organize field trips in the first year, particularly if you're taking you know, the earth, energy and ecosystems, you get to explore the credit river system. You can see this photograph where the students are actually um, there are near that credit river and they're collecting data. You will also inspect the downtown commercial core as a part of one of your first year courses. You will study Toronto's ethnic neighborhoods as well as explore the Niagara region, which is in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. In your senior years, however, you get to go outside of Canada. We offer field trips every year. We go, we've been to Ireland, Paris, Germany. We've been to um, Shanghai and Beijing particularly. Uh, and the, these field trips are about 10 to 12 days long. And they are absolutely interesting because you not only learn about the you know, economic geography, but also you learn about physical geography, social geography, and so on. Our department also has exchange programs with several universities in Europe, as well as in Asia. We have uh, links with universities in China, France, Germany, and India. In China, the instruction is in Mandarin, in France, in French, in Germany, in German, and in India, um, the instruction is normally in English. Another very important aspect of our particular program within the Faculty of Arts is that we have 350 hours of real work. We call this internship where the student is placed with various organizations in the Toronto area where they learn one-on-one -on, -one on how to use the GIS techniques on a daily basis. So they are not only getting um, an experience of actually using the knowledge they've learned in class and working for an organization, but they're also getting a, a sort of a you know hands-on experience of how to deal with other colleagues, how to work as a team, etc. So as you can see, these are two maps uh, that we are displaying here. One, which is the biodiversity diversity information analyst, uh, which is uh, done with nature conservation, conservancy of sorry, Nature Conservancy of Canada. The other one is GIS analysts, analysts uh, who has done it for Metroland Publishing. Um, those of you who are more inclined toward academic work, you can do research projects with faculty. Here are some examples of the research projects that the faculty has been undertaking. And we always, always love to have undergraduate students work with us as our colleagues in, in, uh, in these uh, various projects. The byproduct of this is 
that you get to publish with the faculty and you also get to present at academic as well as other conferences. This means that those students also get an idea how to, how to speak uh, in public, how to actually um, you know, create these uh, presentations as well as this gives them the opportunity and sort of gives them a go ahead in the academic field if they want to do so. Over to Nelson. Hi, everyone. My name is Nelson Damba, and I'm a fourth year student in the Geographic Analysis Program. So, so students will be working, mainly working on their assignments within small classes or labs that fit 35 to 40 students at max capacity. It has strong student organization as they will be able to make connections with each other, as well as good connections with alumni that will help them throughout their Ryerson career. There are two GIS labs, one that is used for class, one that is for classroom use, which means it is only used at certain times for certain classes, and another that is open, which is open during Ry regular Ryerson hours and open to Ryerson students for use. Although it's mainly beneficial for GA students, as it uses up-to-date software and real-world data that will benefit them on, benefit them working on their assignments. So an example is this map done by a previous GA student named Michael Marchietta, which shows the global light path in May 2013 using high quality GIS work. Another example is this, are these two maps that show the relationship between the 2014 election and social media, specifically Twitter. And the first map shows the, the proportion of people who have completed their political views, but in areas that are, that are high, such as downtown Toronto and areas that are low, such as North Etobicoke. And the second map shows the number of people who have used Twitter to tweet the election candidate name the most, such as an example being in downtown Toronto, the name Ford was tweeted the most, but in the Scarborough area, the name Tory was tweeted the most. And these two maps are, are only a few examples of the work that GA will be able to create using based on real world topics. Um, back to me. Um, so as a first year student, um, you're entitled to um, apply for a, a financial scholarship if your average is over, your high school average is over 80%. And then each year of study, if you achieve a certain GPA, then you're entitled to um, another financial um, amount. So here's an outline uh, for, for your um, information. So what do our students go on to do? Um, so our degree equips students with lots of really valuable transferable skills that employers are looking for right now. So the study of geographic analysis homes many skills that employers like, such as observational and analytical skills, the ability to take in quantities of information, and also to think critically. And it gives students the capacity to understand continuity and change in a range of contexts based on broad knowledge basis. So our graduates come out with hands-on desirable skills such as IT and technical skills. We also have a high success rate of students going into meaningful employment and also going on to grad school. So the sorts of careers our students enter are varied but include sectors such as town planning, cartography, surveying, environmental consultants and campaigners. Many find work in areas loosely related to the subject too. So nearly one fifth of our graduates find work in business, finance and HR, while 10% go into marketing, PR and sales. So other areas include local government, working for utilities companies and non-government agencies, as well as um, areas around engineering. Here's a 
here's a fancy slide with um, lots of other areas as well. So lots of analyst um, work. Here's an outline of some of the jobs and the salaries attached to those as well. So um, our students go on to some really successful careers. As I mentioned, um, our graduates have a high employability rate, and here are some of our recent alumni and the jobs they're doing now. Okay, over to Nathan. Hi everyone, my name is Nathan. I'm a fourth year uh, geographic analysis student like Nelson. Um, I go by he, him pronouns and I'm currently the president of the Students Association of Geographic Analysis, which is kind of the representative uh, student government of our program. Um, so uh, Saga for short, um, basically does the little things that kind of um, helps to round out the program. A lot of that includes like throwing on social events, professional events with um, a lot of the alumni that you've seen um, to kind of bring back and kind of show like as a like a living breathing example of, for students of the actual success of the program and to help with uh, networking and whatnot. Um, so because a lot of our program, as Sue Thomas said before, is kind of based on getting you out into the field and getting a job. So we want to really focus on that and really maintain a lot of the ties with our alumni so we can actually um, get internship opportunities for everyone. Um, so that's kind of what Saga does um, in and of itself. And uh, we definitely want to see you come back um, and contribute because um, our community is very uh, community oriented. We try to tend to foster that because a lot of those relationships translate into the working world. Um, there's a lot of times where our alumni uh, have been working on um, projects from different angles from under different uh, corporations and a lot of this community tends to really help out in terms of uh, going back and forth between shifting job markets so which is especially relevant um, in this day and age and if there's any questions then we're we're welcome to take any right now we do have some lined up so um, the first one has is what makes this program, geographic analysis, different from maybe other schools? What makes Ryerson's program super unique? I can speak to that. I'm not sure why the camera is not on on my, uh, I can't see myself anyway. Um, the, uh, that's Nathan. Um, Ryerson program, the program at Ryerson is unique, particularly because of its geographic analysis program, which is based on GIS. Uh, it is also applied in nature. So there are several other programs, for example, at other universities, which also provide a GIS sort of as one of the courses. But in most of our courses, uh, particularly those that are technically oriented, uh, GIS is the focus. So the students not only learn um, various concepts of geography, such as, for example, what is urbanization, uh, what is neighborhood inequality, but they also learn how to use census data and look for the various aspects of neighborhood inequality, for example, in space. So then they use GIS to map those inequalities. So that is what makes our program unique um, because of its application uh, orientedness. The other thing that I would say is that internship is the uh, is the, is one of the main features of our program, where students get firsthand uh, experience. Um, uh, you know about uh, learning uh, how to work within an office environment, how to actually use data and map and, uh, you know, do that for a purpose um, and write reports, for instance. Um, and uh, these kinds of internships actually um, is, is, a, is a major step in career building. Um, could I just add something from sort of my perspective, working on the ground with the students that um, our program is relatively small um, compared to some programs um, at other universities in Ontario. So I feel like 
our students, um, our student body really get to know each other and they really get to know the professors. So it's sort of, um, yeah, like Nathan was saying, it's a real community, it feels like a real community. Um, you're not just a number or faces, everyone sort of knows each other. And by the end of the program, um, you know, I'll, I'll know everyone by name. It's, um, I think from my perspective anyway, that's what makes it so special. Awesome, thank you. All right, we do have some more questions ready to go. Um, so the next one actually does have to do with internships now that we've already discussed it. What year um, do students um, take their internships? What are the details behind their internships? Uh, can we go a little bit more in depth in that? I think you mentioned it, so it sparks some interest. Do one of the students want to take that? It looks like Nathan wants to answer that question. Yeah, I can definitely answer that question. So currently our internship goes um, or is assigned between the summer of um, between year three and year four. Um, with that, as mentioned before, we kind of ask students to kind of have 350 hours to kind of show for their internship period, which kind of amounts to like a full time summer job. Um, a lot of the internships uh, can be paid. Um, again, this is a, this is the actual job market. It's competitive. So what we want is for students to kind of go out there. You have to apply for the jobs. You have to see if you're a right fit, if the employer sees you're a right fit. So yeah, I mean, it's basically like any other job share, um, search. And uh, yeah, if you have to go and find something that you want to get paid for, you can definitely do that. Um, but sometimes, you know, there are opportunities um, because everyone wants to graduate on time and it's this is a requirement of the program what happens is, is that you know, sometimes you may not be able to find something um, that can pay you but you need the hours so in that regard i mean you can still go out and find something it's just you have to actually go out and actually find it amazing thank you all right the next question has to do with student life um, how easy is it to integrate into student life? Um, so the student particularly is a mature student. Um, maybe you can also talk just a little bit about some of the student life initiatives that, uh, that's, that are specific to this program. Yeah, um, so I, I myself am as a mature student too. I came in when I was around maybe like 20 years old. I'm around 23 now. So yeah, I mean like you, it's, it's basically any other judgment. You feel like any other student, there's nothing too big to have. Um, so I think like if the adjustment is fine, especially in like a smaller community because you really get to know people, um, you get to know the faculty, you get to know the other students, um, especially in other years, you'll be able to get to know. And as Nelson mentioned before in the geography lab, since everyone is working in these smaller, more intimate spaces that you can kind of have um, these kind of social interactions, which makes it easier for everyone to kind of get to know each other. So it's not really too big of um, a gap or, or anything like that. And like integration into like student life is, uh, it's inherently built into the program just the way it's actually set up. If I can add to that, uh, Lara, uh, this is Sutama. I just want to tell you that as a mature student, what you bring into the program is your life experience. I think that is more than uh, in, you know, enough. Uh, and it actually helps you because you already have experienced certain, uh, you know, uh, things. For example, uh, you know, people who are fresh off high school uh, may not actually know or may not actually think about uh, certain issues that you will. So I think um, that really helps. Amazing. Thank you. And uh, that student just replied back saying that it was a comforting reply. So we appreciate uh, your kind of words, both of you, Nathan and Tama. So the next question is about the city of Toronto. Is there an advantage to studying geographic analysis in a city like Toronto? Yes. Um, 
Definitely. Toronto, as you know, uh, is a laboratory uh, in a way um, because, you know, in every field, whether it is, as I said, it is urban studies is one of our specialities. So, yes, if you want to learn about the city forms and city lives, then definitely Toronto, uh, you know, is, is, is a wonderful platform. But also, if you want to learn about the environment, then in and around Toronto, in minutes, uh, actually, um, uh, you know, uh, you can go to a wilderness uh, such as Credit River Valley or Niagara, and you can actually uh, learn. So Toronto is uniquely uh, placed in that sense. Furthermore, Toronto has moved from being an industrial city to being a city which is now uh, considered a global city. So this whole, um, you know, um, sort of uh, you know, the way in which Toronto has uh, changed is itself very interesting, particularly from a geographical point of view, uh, which takes into consideration space and time, right? So yeah, definitely. Amazing. All right. Um, you mentioned concentrations within the presentation. Is one more is one concentration more popular than another? Can students do more than one concentration, or can they be fluid with all of them? Um, the constant there are four concentrations, which basically means that uh, you take uh, you know courses electives that build toward that concentration. Many times it happens that people think, hey, you know what, I'm interested in urban studies, and then they think, you know, I'm interested in urban studies, but I'm also interested in urban studies as it as it relates to the urban environment, and then they move toward that. That's completely okay. Um, you know, we are not giving you a specialized honors. Uh, you know, this is a BA honors degree. And the concentration is up to you. Uh, actually, um, many people like to do business um, or, or um, you know, uh, where we say location analysis, so to speak, as their area of concentration. That's totally permissible, of course. Great. The next question is a little bit more uh, geared towards student life. Are, what are some of the events that Geographic Analysis Student Union uh, puts on and how have these changed during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Have they perhaps changed to virtual events or maybe something else? Yeah, uh, so basically our events, actually one is happening today to be honest with you. Uh, we kind of switched to um, having events via Zoom and usually what would happen is these events, especially for the professionally related ones, uh, kind of were like the speed dating events in which we would allow, bring back a lot of alumni and we would break the students off into groups and have them talk to each alumni to get a little bit of experience about a different field. And then we would kind of open it up into um, a more open kind of like networking, more relaxed um, Q&A mingle session. So basically with that is we kind of use the Zoom breakout rooms option and we kind of bounce around the speakers um, between the different rooms with the students. So we can kind of get that same amount of experience. This year is a little different in terms of we, um, we wanted to do a lot more in terms of helping the students because of COVID-19 and um, how everyone is a little disconnected. So we kind of had a few new events. Our first really new event was focused around um, graduate studies and to see, you know, some students are interested in doing things after their undergraduate. So we brought back alumni with PhDs who are pursuing master's degrees. And from there, they were able to go in and talk to the students again from uh, various different perspectives. Um, the one PhD had a PhD in geography who was actually a sitting faculty in the department. Um, a few others, I believe, had um, backgrounds in urban planning as well. And one had an engineering uh, master's as well. So that was for that event. Um, the one event today is kind of focused on kind of like more intro level uh, jobs and from that would be kind of classified as people who have like less than five years of experience in the field who are alumni. Um, from here we have people ranging more on like the business research side in terms of retail. We have um, others who are just out in the field and, and doing a lot of um, real estate analysis and um, that's kind of the stuff that we want to provide in terms of giving uh, like students a lot of different perspectives. Um, our 
next two professional events will be happening next semester, and they will be centered around um, kind of managerial and executive level perspectives. So we'll bring in um, alumni who are kind of um, at that mid tier position in terms of like managing other people who kind of have like over five years, maybe five years plus level experience. And then we'll bring in students um, or past alumni or current alumni, sorry, who have actually moved up into like the executive level experience of um, their companies and whatnot. So we'll bring in like CEOs, directors to really give students that kind of perspective of like what each level of your career can look like if you decide to go that far. And aside from that, I mean, we have like social events as well. Earlier in the semester, we had a lot of social events in terms of, again, just trying to incorporate all the different years to get to know each other because we don't really have a lot of that um, social interaction anymore. And yeah, that's kind of um, what Saga's job is. Amazing, thank you. And uh, before we move on, is do you wanna maybe plug some social handles so for students to learn um, maybe a little bit more about the events that um, are being hosted? Oh yeah, uh, definitely. If you can kind of go to um, our Instagram, Bry Saga, so that's at R-Y-E-S-A-G-A. -E um, and you can go check out like all the posts we put there for that. And um, honestly, if you use that handle, I believe it's the same handle across all of our social media, even our LinkedIn. So you can go check us out there too. And you, you can definitely see like how we're building up everything, you know, how we try to keep connections, how we have a lot of our events, how we have, I try to put things on and really foster a good community here um, because it's not only about um, it's not just about getting a job but it's also about like maintaining these things to actually pull more people from our program into like very lucrative positions so that's why we try to maintain this culture because like our field is very specialized it's very small a lot of people know each other so it just um, it helps a lot amazing thank you um, all right, the next question is, will I be able to work while I go to school? How much heavier does course, do course loads get as you move into the senior years of the program? Um, yeah, so the thing about the program is that it, it really is, the, the way you get the most out of this program is, is what you put into it. So there, there are various courses that range in terms of the, their difficulty. And again, like you can go in and, and ask like various students. A lot of people are open. Um, if you want to email me or you try to get in contact with me through any of the, um, the contacts for um, Ryerson's um, or for Saka's social media, then we definitely do that. Um, it's not the hardest thing in the world, even with the hardest courses. But um, with that, like you would want like to space out like your degree, like maybe you would like to take um, a, a reduced course load just to kind of help out. But again, like there's a lot of opportunities at school as well. Like Sutama mentioned, like there's, um, you can have like a lot of um, research opportunities with as an RA. You can find a lot of full-time employment through a lot of the internships opportunities we have by the alumni. So it's definitely doable and, I, and I've seen it happen itself. Yeah, actually one of the alumni that's coming back to speak today is like pretty much did that. He works full time while going to school as well. So yeah, I, it's possible. It's definitely doable. I, can I just add to that? Um, I guess it depends on um, how many hours you intend to work. I mean, some students um, uh, are working full time and want to do our program that could be challenging outside of COVID we don't have that many courses online um, but certainly for part-time work it is possible um, our students actually have eight years to complete the degree um, typically a full-time uh, path through the degree would be four years so two semesters a year of five courses each is full-time but like I said, you have got eight years, so you could spread it out and manage it that way. So it's definitely possible. I also want to take the opportunity to plug our Career Boost program and our work study programs at Ryerson. It's a really great opportunity for you to get some um, a job on campus. Um, and the advantage of getting a job on campus is that everyone knows you're a student, that your studies come first. So your work hours kind of get placed in and around your classes, not the other way around, which is 
great. Uh, some of our jobs include, you can actually work with the therapy dogs um, once a week. That's a part-time job. Someone gets paid to work with the therapy dogs. You work around social media um, and marketing. And really, there's, the sky's the limit. And there's always specific courses, uh, sorry, jobs or careers uh, to the specific um, majors that we offer. Also, I once upon a time when I was a student uh, completing my VA, I had three part-time jobs. Um, so getting having a job while you're a student is a very common thing. Um, and like Sarah mentioned, you have time. You can spread out your studies in order to um, make it work. Um, and you can talk to your professors about that as well and to other students because we're all in this together at Ryerson. All right, this one is specific to our students. Um, where did, and you might've already mentioned this, Nathan, so forgive me, but where did you complete your internship and what was the experience like? And maybe we can get Nelson in there as well to speak a little bit about this. Okay. Um, for me personally, I, the internship started in third year. So like that is when we were supposed to apply and I did. How unfortunately, it also, it's probably due to COVID, but I wasn't able to get any internships, though I have still been searching. And there's a lot of remote, because there's a lot of remote jobs that, which means you just work from your laptop, doing doing work with GIS from for other locations, as well as um, the career booth she 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 mentioned, which I've applied to, and so far I'm I'm still waiting for the results, but I. Haven't had my internship experience just yet. Yeah, just, just to echo a little bit of uh, Nelson's sentiments. So uh, obviously our year was a little bit different because of COVID-19, um, but even to that point, the faculty are working very hard in, in terms of like trying to get students like research positions so we can actually be able to complete um, their hours. I will say though, like my case is a little different because um, I actually kind of, did a, a lot of internship stuff like coming right out of my first year I was able to do things between the, the summer between my first and second year so I, I kind of had like a, a an IT support job with GIS at, at that point and I also in the months leading up to COVID-19 uh, I had two jobs kind of I kind of worked with the Department of Geography in terms of like um, laying out like, str strategic backgrounds for uh, developing the department. And in another aspect, I was working kind of like a data analyst, retail analyst position at, um, actually this was another research center out of Ryerson as well, um, called the Center of Study for Commercial Activity. So there's definitely a lot of experiences and a lot of opportunities to kind of get internships even within Ryerson. But, um, yeah, I mean, like even like outside, you, you you definitely will not have a problem. Even during COVID, uh, over the summer, I've been talking to various students, and I know that uh, one especially was able to get a remote job working for I believe it's it's a bank. I believe it's RBC. Um, so it, it's definitely doable, even in this environment. And maybe Sarah and Sutama can talk about some places that students have gotten um, placements in the past as well. Um, okay, I will go. Um, so um, students have been placed at various uh, organizations, uh, you know, starting from Canada Post to Environments and Analytics, uh, which is also, I need to talk a little bit about uh, this particular uh, organization because they actually um, uh, sponsor a ton of awards, uh, particularly uh, in, you know, for students who are doing very well uh, in our program. And these are monetary awards. And these are given away during our award night, which is actually coming up very soon. Um, other than uh, these, uh, you know, uh, 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 an organization like that, uh, Environment Canada, um, also uh, various other organizations, um, you know, uh, housing, uh, social housing. Uh, I know that it used to be called MTHA before, uh, Metro Toronto Housing Association. Um, and as well as Lob Laws, um, you know, which is a huge uh, company that has a number of other uh, companies under it. So uh, these are some of the, um, you know, top, uh, oh yeah, I forgot, the CNE. 
uh, these are uh, some of our top uh, places that uh, actually get our students. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, Citizenship Immigration Canada. Um, uh, you know, uh, these are some of the organizations uh, who often ask us, you know, do you have anybody? Um, so, yeah. Amazing. Um, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. Um, I actually have a friend in her 40s, which is the same as me. Uh, now I don't look it. But, um, and she took our program and is now uh, did her internship at Scotiabank and now is like senior director at Scotiabank. So, yeah, it's lots of opportunities for internships. Yeah. And we offer a lot of support to students. We have a lot of links. So, wouldn't be alone. We have a lot of support to make sure you get the right thing. And I think that's something always to mention about that connection with your program as well as with your professors. I think a lot of students are nervous to talk to their professors. I know back in the day, I definitely was. I found them intimidating, uh, but really, they're they're there to help you. That's their that's part of their job, and that's why they likely got into this field. Uh, so please go to those resources, whether it be the people in your program, fellow students, or even your professors and use them um, because they're, th they're there for a reason. All right, we have a question. This is for the current students. What was something you didn't expect to learn during your degree, but really appreciate now? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's anything special to our degree. I think it's mostly in terms of like the university experience. Um, I, I would say the time management, like just like general life, life skill, essentially, that was probably the strongest thing you kind of get out of um, university in general. But I, I guess maybe it is emphasized a little bit in our degree, just because within the Faculty of Arts, um, it, it is probably like the most technically oriented degree. So like the jump from, you know, uh, the requirements um, of like 70% English and then after to come in and like you have to go into basically more or less kind of a, a, like a semi IT kind of job. Um, it definitely is um, not a lot, but like, again, you, you, you get out what you put into it, right? So I, I would say that's definitely like the most important thing, just learning how to like manage your time. Um, for me, I think it's how much the program geographic analysis, how much connections it has to other topics like politics or, or crime or environmental analysis. Because in my first year, when I was doing certain electives based on those, I never realized how much GIS or GA was like referenced in those other courses. But it also got me, but it was referenced a lot and I realized how much like geographic analysis connects to other parts of the, of the topic, such as like crime analysis and crime mapping. There's aspects of GIS that, that can be used as well as like environmental and urban sustainability when you're working with physical geography or just, or just environmental sustainability, like being your minor. So that got me interested in, in taking an EUS minor as well, because I, because with me, I'm more focused on the physical geography part. So I didn't expect to learn how connected it was, but I'm glad I did. That's amazing. And you mentioned GIS. Maybe we can go a little bit more in detail about what that is in case anyone at home is not aware of what that is. Oh, Nathan or Nate, sorry, Nelson, sorry, you're on mute. So like, ge ge so it's like geographic information system, which is like using mapping soft, mapping software and like real life topic, real life data topics. So like I mentioned before with crime, you can like use it demographically, like to see, like, for example, in the city of Toronto, you can see like, the proportion of where like most where most crimes take place compared to like demographics is it in low income areas is it in high income areas you can make maps that are 
chlor such as chloroplex maps, like the darker it is, the more the lower the income this area is. And you can also make other maps on um, map symbologies on top of it, which showcase like the crime itself, such as dot density. So it's like combining two map mapping um, symbols together. If I may add to that, uh, the point that we are trying to uh, get through is that why do you need these maps? That is more important than, uh, you know, you're drawing the map. What is the purpose of it? Let's give you an example. A few years ago in Nepal, there was an earthquake, an earthquake. And after that earthquake, people did not know what are, because all the roads had vanished, right? So people didn't know how to, uh, you know, send resources. Where are the resources necessary? This is when you have, if you have GIS techniques, which our students helped out in, uh, you know, uh, mapping for Earth, uh, Nepal, uh, is uh, in that project, our students came up with these ideas that, hey, you know what, we can do uh, a various combinations of these maps to show where these people, what is the uh, uh, population density, what is the economic condition, how hard hit has, uh, are they, as a result of the earthquake. So what you're doing through GIS is what is known as layering. So you're layering that information, where the earthquake has occurred, who has it actually, um, uh, you know, um, uh, who has it affected and what is the level of that effect. And as a result, then you're giving uh, information to the policymakers to get the resources there, okay? That's one example. Another example is that recently, as you know, there was a um, there was a world pandemic, and of course, COVID is also COVID nineteen, of course, as a pandemic. And one of the ways in which GIS can help is that to say, hey, COVID has actually, um, you know, it has started in this part of Italy or it has, it is now here, it is moving there. And you can with GIS actually predict where it is going to go next. And as a result, again, just as in the earthquake situation, you are informing, informing authorities, informing policymakers what to do. So therefore, um, not only just GIS, mind you, geography in general, non-technical geography uh, knowledge, geographical knowledge uh, at the university level actually is about this. So this is definitely an area of interest. On that note, someone actually just asked, um, saying maybe they're not. Maybe if someone's not very good, not very tech savvy, um, is GIS something that GIS mapping would that be difficult to learn? Um, how much level of computer savviness do you need prior to going into the program, if any? Hey, fantastic question. I love it. Guess what? I'm the program director of geographic analysis program and I am not a GIS person, but that doesn't mean that I don't know and appreciate what GIS can do. So our program is although technical, you know, there is a technical side of it and that is what we, uh, you know, we excel in. We have a slew of courses that are non-technical. So I teach a number of these, of course, I'm not a GIS person. So I teach a number of these courses where you actually uh, don't have to know GIS. What level of computer uh, savviness uh, you need to have? I would say really basic level, but I think Nelson and uh, um, Nathan can talk more about that. Uh, what I wanted to tell you is that you don't have to be technically savvy to be a geographer. Yeah, just to go off of that, um, like Tutana said, there are a bunch of uh, non-technical courses that aren't GIS oriented, um, at least from like the computer sense. So you, you can go that route if you want to, but even in the more technical sense, like we know we're not pulling people with um, generally like the best computer knowledge, if any computer knowledge. So like in the first years and even beyond that, like at the start of the semester, like we really understand and we take the time to really show step by step by step and really break it down. It's like, hey, like this is how you go about this. So 
everyone everyone has like equal opportunity we we understand people are more or less starting out with ground zero like within a incoming cohort probably less than like five people even know what gis is or and less than that maybe like only two have actually used it in their in their life um so we know who who's coming in and we cater to that incredibly even in the more technical fields or technical courses sorry Yeah, it's important to know we we know you're not experts coming into any of our programs. That's why you're coming to school to become those experts. And it's our job to turn you into those experts. So do not be afraid. We are we are going to be there every step of the way to to kind of guide you through that process. All right, we do have an, another question. We're running short on time, so we're only going to ask about two more questions. How much math does this program contain? I guess the students should answer this because uh, I may put it down or up. I think it's better for the students to answer this. Um, in my experience, when it when it comes to math, that in this program, there it's not it's not like the high school level math, or it's not really. Because we're working with GIS programs, so usually the program is programmed to do the map for you. It's just like all you have to do when you're working with it say, is like just put in the formula, like what you want divided or multiplied. It's it's not too. It's really not too difficult. It's it's basic. Yeah, to kind of go off of Nelson's uh, point, like this is this is not um, like an engineering degree. Like you're not you're not going to need functions. You're not going to need calculus. A lot of this is arithmetic, specifically for statistics. Um, and the, again, very intro stuff. We're we're not a math program. You'll you'll learn some of it because you learn like you know sometimes you need to normalize your data, and in that like you need to just make it fit per populations. But again, like this is this will be taught in your courses. We're not expecting anyone to know any of this. So like you guys will be seen shown step by step how to go about this. Um, so there really is no need to worry about like oh like do I need to like you know remember. Uh, I, I don't know, like the equation to like draw a line or anything like that. We, we, we're not going to ask you any of that. You guys don't need any of that. All you need to know is like, yeah, maybe a little bit about like, you know, how to add, subtract, uh, multiply and divide. And honestly, once you have that and like, again, maybe some basic algebra here and there, but again, that will be, that will be broken down for you. So you guys don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Amazing. All right. We don't have a lot of time left. So I'm going to close off this session by asking one final two-parter question. For our students, what has been your favorite course that you've taken so far? And where are you hoping to work when you finish your degree? Okay. So my favorite courses actually so far have been 221 which is location analysis and 241 which is cartography the cartography because you get to learn how to produce different maps based on demography data analysis spatial analysis and data modeling and location and location analysis was also my favorite because you because it also went into to that but you focused more on the demographics part, as well as the location, such as we learned how to geocode different different areas. Like an example is one of my assignments. I, had, I learned how to geocode the locations of the cop stores within the city of Toronto. And, and then like write more of a report about the areas, about the areas they are in. And like, if you can like suggest where to put in any new locations within Toronto or even a bit outside of it. And where I wanna work after is first I wanna do my master's in spatial analysis. And then I actually have a brother 
Noel Damba, who works at Ryerson, he's the technical analyst. So, so I was thinking, I'm not too specific yet where I want to work, but I was thinking maybe working at Ryerson would be a good place to start before I before I go out there and into the real world. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess just for me, my favorite courses would be a course called uh, Geo521, Geodemographics, which is, it kind of touches a lot on what Nelson was um, also speaking about, just to, like maybe a, a little higher level, because I, I found it interesting how it really tied uh, a lot of the concepts we were learning into like uh, a more real world kind of application, um, specifically for retail for that course. And I guess in, uh, the second or uh, my co-favorite course in that regard would kind of be advanced remote sensing, which is kind of an upper level course that kind of really kind of analyzed like the, the more physical environment. Um, and for that course, like I was analyzing like forest fires in Africa. So I, I really liked how I was able to take part of that project. Um, I will say that the, we kind of had a different um, teacher for that course in terms of she was just a contract lecturer, but I, I still see that it uh, was a really valuable opportunity. Um, where I would like to work in the field is um, a little different than most GIS people as I would like to lean more into the IT side and maybe go into um, more data science and more of like a, a data engineer kind of career. Well, that's awesome. I wish you both the best of luck in your in your studies as you continue and hopefully you end up exactly where you both want to be. Um, thank you so much to all of our presenters, not only our students, Nelson and Nathan, but also uh, Sarah and Sumenta who for this amazing session. I know I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone watching has learned so much as well. Um, it is 10 o'clock, so we are going to say goodbye and turn off our cameras and our audio. But on behalf of Ryerson University, thank you once again for joining us today. And we hope to see you at our future sessions throughout the week and beyond. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.